Greetings, unsettled souls. <laughs> Sam I.B. DeGange doing political commentary. The media speaks. You might know me from Blasting News. You might know me from Wits News. If you should know me from Wits News, make sure you check out my uh, latest article there. It has to do with... Uh, a little bit about the politics of the season, but also it goes in a little bit about um, things to be happy about, if you will, that don't involve politics, which is something different for Wits News. Um, for those of you that uh, don't follow any of my political stuff, there is an awesome article on a sheet on drugs. Uh, Lee Fraser, long, long time friend of mine. I've gone to see them for years and years and years. I was lucky enough to do an interview with Lee, and you can find that on Lasting News. And before I get into the massive Fukushima update, and if you're just tuning in, yes, absolutely, there is going to be news here that will be relevant after the uh, after the Christmas holiday. But I do want to say a couple of words about Christmas. Um, I think what I'd like to say the most, and I kind of went over this again in my head. I thought about perhaps typing it out or making it formal. And each time I thought about doing it, I put it off. And I think I just, I think it's best said like this. Whoever it is that you are with this Christmas, even if you are 150% sure that you know, that they know how you feel, you should probably go ahead and make double sure. And I've just found that through the regular um, cycling of life that, and this is a rather grim statement to say on Christmas Eve, I don't want to bring ball humbuggery or anything, but in many instances I have found evil to be much stronger than good. Uh, by that I mean, I think a lot of really People are judged by the worst thing they do. Even if they've, you know, saved kittens in a burning house fire, you know, carrying out orphans in one hand and kittens in the other, and mew, mew, wah, wah, it doesn't matter. You know, they yelled at somebody sometime or something. Um, I, I think people tend to take things to heart, to which... I think negativity is given much more of a prevalence in people's memory or reflection on other people than the person who may have actually done. So um, I think it's important. I think it's something that I have seen in a number of people's lives, uh, obviously to some degree my own, but I just, I've seen it repeated again and again to where somebody will do something or say something and then immediately there's like a shut off valve. And on the other side of that, if you're one of those people, don't do that. Don't do that. Think about it. If you only judged people by the very best thing they ever did, that would also be equally dumb. We would all be talking about what a humanitarian Adolf Hitler was, because he was the first leader of a major country to outlaw animal abuse. Okay. See, things don't really work like that. So, uh, you know, for what it's worth, I think there's a lot of logic in what I just said. And that's really all I want to say about it for the time being because I am uh, going to move on to why everyone tuned in. And that is, of course, for the massive Fukushima update. Um, Zero Hedge Energy Nobel Prize winner suggests blasting nuclear waste with lasers. Now, you may wonder why this wasn't on the, the dumdy of the day. I haven't studied it enough to know if it deserves the dumdy of the day or if it's something that there could be some hope in. The trouble is that the nuclear industry as a whole has lied to us with such frequency and with such depth that only a madman would trust them at this point to um, tell the truth about anything. So you, you have to wonder... Can this be weaponized? Because if it can, then certainly the nuclear industry is going to allow it to happen, even if it can be used for the greater good, as it's mentioned with here. And it didn't make this show's prep, but I'm, I'm going in, uh, I already have one of the articles for next month, uh, Fukushima Update, and it deals with what this nuclear waste is doing sitting where it is. 
how a, a group of our bravest in America went to a place called K2. I know, not that kind of K2. And while they were dealing with some of the fallout after the 9-11 attacks, they were put in an area where the former Soviet Union had stored radioactive waste along with chemical weapons uh, leftovers and a few other nice nice uh, Christmas gifts, if you will. And they ended up with horrible illness. So the idea that something could maybe be done to minimize that is good. It's just that you wonder how many other arms are on this octopus and exactly how it could possibly be used in ways that are nefarious or perhaps different from the ones being portrayed here. But uh, that said, let me know in the comment line what you guys think of this. I need you guys hit and share. I need you hit and subscribe. Because if you don't, then it just sits on the internet with no hits at all. So it's pretty much up to you guys. So it'd be quite a gift. Uh, many have made strong arguments, writes Tyler Durden, for the potential of nuclear power to be the clean energy solution of the future. As the need to curb carbon emissions grows more dire, which it doesn't, the ultra-efficient zero-emissions energy provided by nuclear looks like a more and more obvious solution. There are some drawbacks, however, yeah, you could say that, to uh, nuclear energy. Of course, there is the ever-present concern of nuclear meltdown, and that has kept civilians and politicians alike extremely wary of widespread nuclear energy production in the wake, of course, of, uh, they mentioned Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and Chernobyl. While the death toll from nuclear disasters is actually low, and that right there is a bit of misinformation. I don't. I usually really like what Tyler Durden wrote, but he didn't research this very well. The official numbers are very low, only because people didn't die of it immediately. And I, I, I had a bonehead on my comment line claiming to be this great debunker, and he was citing the same numbers that are, are that uh, this gentleman had got. But the trouble with that, again. That's not, you don't walk by a nuclear power plant and die if it's melting down. Unless, you know, you're horrifically unlucky, like those poor schmucks that were grabbing pieces of the actual, you know, cylinder. Or the people that were watching the uh, skies when Fuka and uh, Chernobyl went red. Okay, yeah, that, that, but that's thankfully not yet common. So, this develops over time prone to colds, then you should be. Maybe you get a few more flus than you should, yada yada. Then maybe you're some kind of a heart problem that came out of nowhere, even if you're the healthiest of eaters and aren't even prone to it with family history. And on and on and on until finally the cancer or whatever gets you. But the nuclear poisoning that you suffered had had dire effects on your life the entire time, but it simply wasn't um, considered a death from that. And that's one of the ways that the nuclear industry has been able to hide a whole myriad of sins was with that little trick. And you have a lot of people that are pro-nuclear that will many times quote those numbers and they're out of context for the reason that I've given you, which is of course why you've tuned in and hit subscribe. Thank you. Um, Anyway, he writes, while the death toll from nuclear disasters is actually quite low, the long-term damage from these tragedies endures. In Japan, the government has been using so much water to keep the reactors at Fukushima from overheating since the 2011 disaster that they have run out of space to store it, and have even considered, as we've covered many times, dumping the radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. As for Chernobyl, well, you've all seen the miniseries. And then there is the major issue of nuclear waste, and this is where we get into the nuts and bolts of this article. Um, as efficient and carbon-free as it is, nuclear power certainly isn't the cleanest form of energy production thanks to its extremely hazardous byproducts that can stay radioactive for millions of years. Yes, that is true, but you have to remember that even when a nuclear power plant is running as it's supposed to, they have what's called routine releases, where um, some elements are simply radioactive poisons are released into the atmosphere in order that the plant simply depressurize, for lack of a better word, layman's terms. The trouble is that venting, or whatever you want to call it, that release is toxic. 
And that's why Helen Caldercott, Dr. Caldercott calls them all routine releases that lead to routine cancers. And of course, there's no such thing as a routine cancer. Making matters worse, there is still no scientific consensus on how to solve the issue. In the United States, the burden of paying to store and maintain nuclear waste deposits falls on the taxpayers. And the price tag is massive. For, so for those of you that think you're saving money on nuclear, this is another way that you're paying that you're not even thinking about it. Not to mention the subsidies which were given. Your tax dollars were given, or tax dollars they didn't have to pay is another way to look at it in order to pay for the nuclear uh, power plant to even open because they are so toxic and so expensive that nobody in their right mind would ever insure them. So taxpayers pay that way as well. As And you say it's good for the environment. As oil price reported last year in a report entitled The Crushing Cost of Nuclear Waste is Weighing on Taxpayers, keeping us safe from our own nuclear waste is extremely costly and will grow more expensive the more that we create. Waste, that is. Now that price tag has reached a whopping $7.5 billion, we reported, and the number is only going to keep growing. But now for the first time, there may be a solution to the previously unsolvable nuclear waste issue. Nobel laureate, which doesn't mean as much these days as it used to, but we'll go with it. We have no reason not to trust him again. I'm just being cautious. I haven't studied this as much. It took me by surprise. So again, I want to know what you all think of it. Nobel laureate Gerard Maru has proposed a novel solution that smacks some science fiction and revolves around blasting nuclear waste with lasers. Maru and his research partner, Donna Strickland, won their Nobel Prize in 2018 for their work with chirped pulse amplification. It's a revolutionary invention that creates extremely rapid and ultra-powerful laser pulses with lots of different potential applications. The original research focused on applications like laser machinery and eye surgery, reports extreme tech laser machining. But scientists could also use it to observe atomic processes that happen at almost unfathomable speeds. If we could speed it up a bit more, Maru says CPA would have a use in processing nuclear waste too. According to Maru's hypothesis, damn pop up, CPA could turn the most nuclear waste we have sitting in secure storage facilities around the world where it will otherwise remain radioactive for millions of years into a substance so safe that you can hold it in the palm of your hand. Of course, the CPA processes will require a bit more tweaking to get to the point of capability. Currently, a CPA can produce laser pulses as brief as one at a second. That's a billionth of a billionth of a second. To transmute nuclear waste into something safe, Maru says you would need to increase the pulse by roughly 10,000 times. So I think maybe the reason I haven't read a lot about this is it is quite new. Um, the method would work by blasting nuclear waste with a laser pulse so strong and fast that it could knock protons out of the nuclei of dangerous substances like uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Extremely carcinogenic, very some of the worst elements ever known in the universe, rendering them harmless. If this technology, it says, which other experts agree makes sense in theory, could actually be invented and applied in the next couple of decades. Keep in mind they're saying it's going to take four decades by their guesstimation to put Fukushima totally to rest. It would be difficult to overstate the impact it would have on our energy sector and indeed the entire world. In order to avoid the fast approaching tipping point of catastrophic climate change, again, that's like saying to avoid the tooth fairy. There is no cataclysmic climate change. Any climate change we're seeing now is easily provable as being nothing but responses to sun activity, the same thing that's been through all of recorded history. However, this bonehead, like many other people, th seem to think something needs to be done, and he writes, solving the problem of nuclear waste would make that a whole lot more safer and attainable. What he's not understanding, though, is even if this works, let me repeat myself, the... Nuclear power plants are cancer generators when they are running the way that they're supposed to be. Hello, Merry Christmas, Robert and Steve. Um, very much so. 
So even if you were able to negate a lot of the problem with the waste, later on you would still have the initial problem of the dangers of having the plant open. And again, look up routine releases and I think that uh, it will all become abundantly clear to you. This is uh, APnews.com. Let me remind you, you can donate at the correct views at Hotmail.com through PayPal. I cannot stress to you how much that helps. It is a massive help. You listening to me say this are the only person who pays me for the work that I put in for the videos and the time and the mailing of the dunce caps and all of that. So please consider donating. That would help me quite a bit. The correct views at Hotmail.com through PayPal. Fukushima melted fuel removal begins 2021. The end state unknown. I mentioned before, they're saying it's going to take four decades to take it apart. Uh, the, the problem is, we don't even have the technology that we need to approach it yet. Furthermore, it started off as three decades. Now they're saying 40 or 45. Who knows? Japan's economy and industry ministry proposed a revision Monday of its decades-long roadmap to clean up the radioactive mess at the Fukushima nuclear power plant, which was, of course, wrecked by the tsunami in 11. Nearly nine years after the accident, the decommissioning of the plant, where three reactors melted, remains largely an uncertainty. The revised roadmap, to be formally approved later this month, lacks details on how the complex should look at the end, but maintains a 30 to 40 year target to finish. A look at some of the challenges in decommissioning the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Now keep in mind, that of, we all know. Sorry, I don't know how to help with that, but I'm always learning. My Google just got possessed and started talking out of nowhere. You heard it. Um, the problem here is that now she threw me off. That's great. We all know from basic, basic science, basic science class in second grade, maybe fourth grade, if you were dumb. Japan was created by an earthquake. Tsunami, volcano activities, washing over, eroding, growing, more volcanic activity, more earthquakes. Now, they are hoping that an earthquake isn't going to topple this elaborate balancing of Lincoln logs here. Because if it does, it's going to send a fuel pool of radioactive toxins at three stories high into the ground. It could be a threat to the entire northern hemisphere. To what degree depends on exactly when and how it happens. They don't really mention that here because that's real pretty. Thanks, and you're making my Christmas brighter and brighter. Melted fuel debris. By far the toughest challenge is to remove the 800 tons of nuclear fuel in the three reactors that melted, fell from the cores, and hardened at the bottom of the primary containment vessels. That's called corium. In the past two years, they write, a plant operator, TEPCO, which is GE, General Electric, never invest, get your money out of mutual stocks that they're in, has made progress in gathering details mainly from two of the three reactors. In February, a small telescopic robot sent inside Unit 2 showed these small pieces of debris that came off and must be lifted out. The milestone step of debris removal is scheduled to begin on Unit 2 by the end of 2021. They also don't mention that uh, that robot cooked in time, but it at least got its job done. That's the first robot that man has been able to engineer that could even come close to the reactors. So that needs to be remembered. We can't approach it yet, not even with machines. So how, how do we know we're going to take it down in 30 or 40 years? Mother Nature could quite likely take it down a bit sooner. Earlier assessment of Unit 3 was hampered by high radioactive radiation and water levels in its primary containment vessel. A robotic survey unit at Unit 1 was unsuccessful due to the extremely high radiation levels. Experts say the 30 to 40 year completion target of the decommissioning is too optimistic. Yeah, I, I'm one of those experts, thank you. Uh, some have raised doubts if removing all of the melted fuel is doable and suggest an approach like Chernobyl. Well, that's not going to work. Chernobyl is pretty much centered in the Russian 
ice block that is Russia, okay? It's a great big giant freaking ice block. Now, that may not be the case in millions of years, but it's definitely the case for the foreseeable future. Japan is a very, has a very porous ground. And again, the earthquakes would make that absolutely a time bomb. It would literally be a nuclear time bomb if you tried a Chernobyl house, the, new, the Fukushima power plant. The Russia is nothing like Japan. It would get into the groundwater so fast that your tongue would glow. It says fuel rods, that's another uh, hurdle. Together, the three melted reactors have more than 1,500 units of mostly used nuclear fuel rods still inside that must be kept cool in pools of water. They're among the highest risks at the plant because the pools are uncovered and loss of water from structural damage or sloshing in the event of another major earthquake could cause fuel rods inside to melt and release massive radiation. Again, it talks about how they started removing some of the rods on Unit 3 in April of 2019 and aims to get all 566 of them that are in Unit 3 removed by March of 2021. Uh, removal of the rods from 1 and 2 is to begin in 2023. So yeah, it's Unit 3 they're doing, they did it again in April of 2019. I think I might have read that wrong. TEPCO also plans to remove thousands of at two other units that survived the tsunami. And of course, again, the contaminated water, we talked about that. Radioactive waste, Japan has yet to develop a plan to dispose of the highly radioactive water. Uh, they don't even have any idea what they're gonna do with that. Uh, but they said uh, finding a site and getting public consent to store the waste would be almost impossible. Raising dumps to clean up can be finished within 40 years. That's important. That's another hurdle that could stop it. The other problem is uh, TEPCO has in its space to store only up to 1.37 million tons of water until the summer of 2022, raising speculation that the water may be released after the Tokyo Olympics. And workforce concerns. We've talked about the Fukushima 50, which has become a blanket term for just about all their workers. They find people that are starving to death that are very low on their social chain, and they put them to work as a death sentence half the time, not even giving them working decimeters. Or, you know, telling them, yeah, once, once it's too high, you can't work here. So they don't use the decimeter because they need the money, and they're being exploited by Fukushima. By TEPCO, I should say. Securing workers for the decades-long project is a challenge, especially in a country with a rapidly aging and declining population. TEPCO has announced plans to hire foreign workers. I wonder how long it'll be until Kim Jong-un's uh, newest form of income is sending in his brainwashed minions to clean Fukushima. I wish I was kidding, but let's face it, we live in such a strange world, I don't think it would shock anybody reading this. My shirt. Somebody very special got this for me. Ooh. I didn't know what the quote was until she told me. Strange things are happening in the waters along the West Coast, and the fish are starting to disappear. This is Michael Snyder. I want to give a shout-out to Michael Snyder. Um, he also runs the most important news, and he's been aggregating my work from Wits News on more than a few occasions. So thank you, Mr. Snyder. Um, been a long-time fan. Something is causing the waters, he writes. Just off of the west coast to heat up dramatically, fish are dying off in staggering numbers. Birds that feed on those fish are also dying off rapidly. And scientists have discovered 1,500 holes in the floor of the ocean off the coast of California. Now, what did me and a plethora of other people say was going to happen after Fukushima? Let me remind you here. We said that the waters would heat up, fish would die off, and birds that fed off them would die because of the food chain nature of radiation. They said it wouldn't happen. Well, here it is happening. And now everybody seems absolutely baffled by what it is. It's not baffling to anybody else, specifically, especially because it's happening off the coast of California, on the West Coast, where we said it would happen. Oh, and scientists don't know for certain why any of these things are happening. Horse crap. Unfortunately, the mainstream media is not emphasizing this crisis. No, because GE pays a lot for advertising dollars. 
Most Americans don't even know what's going on, but the truth is that what we are facing is extremely serious. In fact, officials have taken the unprecedented step of shutting down the federal cod fishery in Alaska for a year because of the lack of fish. It was only a few years ago it was high radioactivity and people were warned uh, by anybody with a brain in their head against eating any of it. And now they're not even making it to be caught that it's dying. Boy, that sounds a lot like what we said was going to happen. We are seeing things happen that we have never seen before, and this is definitely going to affect our food supply. So why are the fish dying? Well, nobody knows for sure, but some officials are blaming the marine heat wave that has been happening in the waters along the West Coast. Yeah, and what would that be from? Nuclear. Yeah, then Fukushima would do that, wouldn't it? If you had a great big, as Alex Jones said, neutron star burning away in Japan... That would cause such a thing now, wouldn't it? Scientists are telling us that the water temperature are as much as 6 degrees Fahrenheit above normal, and if such conditions persist, we could see millions upon millions of fish die. But what about global warming, Sam? Global warming would not just affect the Pacific Ocean. Get off it. Global warming isn't happening. Man-made global warming isn't happening. Hopefully this blob, which it says at this point is being told it's an expanse of water a thousand to two thousand miles in size, will go away. But it hasn't happened so far. Meanwhile, fish are dying at an absolutely staggering rate. He talks about Alaska again. Off the Gulf of Alaska, it's closed the 2020 season. And uh, officials are telling us that there are next to no eggs from uh, many of the birds in the area. A stock assessment this fall put the go. Oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, fish eggs. I'm sorry, we'll get to the birds in a minute. The stock assessment this fall put Gulf cod populations at a historic low with next to no eggs, according to NOAA, research biologist Steve Barber, who authored the report. At their current numbers, cod are below the federal threshold that protects them as a food source for endangered stellar sea lions. Which, again, we've seen all kinds of lesions and sores and cancers on sea lions. Food chain. Once below that line, the total allowable catch goes to zero. In other words, the fishery shuts down. And the birds that feed on those fish are also dying in large numbers, writes Snyder. Because of the severe lack of fish, they are literally dropping dead from starvation. And at this point, there isn't much that officials can do about it. The following comes from Big Wobble. In November 2019, thousands of short-tailed shearwater birds migrating from Alaska were washing up dead on Sydney's iconic beaches, and the bird deaths had nothing to do with the massive wildfires. No, it has to do with a great big nuclear disaster going on in Japan that nobody wants to talk about. He says, speaking of weird, scientists are telling us that they found 1,500 holes in the ocean waters off California coast, thousands of strange round holes scooped out of the ocean floor and have been uncovered along the coast of California. Some measure 600 feet across, but scientists are unsure of how they formed. That is strange. That's probably not nuclear. Um, but again, I want to go back to this, the bird thing. I, I kind of glossed over this, but this needs mention. Um, the corpses have been spotted at several shorelines, including Bondi, Manly, and uh, Cronulla, and they're migrating southerly. They're migrating back to southern Australia to breed after de spending the summer in Alaska. Poisoned Alaska. Now, who's been saying you shouldn't live on the West Coast? You shouldn't live in Alaska, California? Who's been saying that? I think it might have been me. Yeah. If you pick me, you're correct. Um... I was quite alarmed when I read that, and even more alarmed by the fact that scientists are telling us that the cause of these holes remain a mystery. There are no incipit potmarks. Overall, a lot more work needs to be done to understand how these features were formed. He writes, for a very long time, you've been warning about what is happening on our planet. Volcanoes are going off like firecrackers all over the globe. And there was another major volcanic eruption in New Zealand on Monday, of course, when he wrote this. And earthquake activity continues to rise at very troubling levels, which, again, goes back to the Fukushima problem, where they're hoping that even though we're seeing all of this activity, the, in the West Coast, which, of course, Pacific Ocean going to Japan, 
all this activity in the ocean that we share with Japan, and they're seeing record numbers of earthquakes, and yet we're supposed to believe that this house of Legos is going to stand for some shaking in the next 40 years. Earthquake tracking website, Earthquake Track, they, they took a long time to pick that name, I think. Out of hundreds of choices was recorded an astounding 59,841 tremors around the globe in the last 365 days on December 9th. In the last 30 days, the total of 4,172 tremors higher than a magnitude 1.5 were felt. An 895 hit in the last seven days. The official story is that everything is fine. Of course it is. But that is not... A normal number of quakes, granted there are many quakes, you could argue, at other times that have been very high, to which I would say it's not just the number, it's the severity. The fact that they're registering over a 1.5 is usually a whisper before a shout, according to what the geological record and plate tectonics have taught us thus far. So I think that cannot be overstated. Only got two stories left, friends. Um, Fukushima radiation and California wine. Now, I mentioned this. The story is a couple of years old. But a, a friend of mine who is a bit of a wine connoisseur had brought up that he, they were drinking a 2017 wine, a, a 2011 wine. And, you know, they, they age appropriately. And, you know, they, wine collectors take that very seriously. It's about the time when a lot of the 2011 and later wines are now being uncorked here. And a lot of those wines are now being drank. They were kept for years and years and years. I would, I would give you the heads up to contemplate maybe not consuming anything that we may have been sake or plum wine or anything from Japan or the West Coast during that time. Uh, likewise, and I've heard this, if you have any <clears throat> bottled wine prior to 2011, particularly if it's not from, if it's not been exposed to anything in Japan or on the West Coast, if you just have uh, sake that you got from Japan and for some reason brought to the middle half of the country or further, that's a very, very expensive bottle of wine. You have. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, again it's a couple of years old, so I'm not going to stay on it. But I'm mentioning it because a lot, like again, a lot of those wines are becoming prime now. Following the uh, Fukushima nuclear power accident, radioactive waste leaked into surrounding areas. Yes, we know that a group of French nuclear physicists tested 18 bottles of California's rosé and Cabernet Sauvignon produced in 2009 and onward, and found that the wines produced after the disaster had increased levels of man-made radioactive particles. The uh, Cabernet uh, Sauvignon, for example, had double the amount. Again, you can tell I know very little about wines. I'm not going to pretend that I do, but I do know an awful lot about radioactivity. So I wanted to put it out there because I know a lot of people will be drinking them uh, during this time of the year. And that brings us to the dumdy of the day. Now, I want to remind you, as we go into the dumdy of the day, that you got to vote. Vote on what? What, Sam? What am I voting on? I need you to vote. I need you to vote um, on what you think the dumbest story was of the year. And they're all in the last Dunce Camp of the Month show that I did. It's 12-24-2019, uh, Christmas Eve, as I'm talking to you now. So it would have been about a week, week and a half ago. Go ahead and look it up. I list the shows. Let me know which one you think the dumbest is out of the list I give you. And I'll be sending out a copy of all of the Dunce Cap of the Month awards to a random, uh, two random listeners is the way that ended up going out, I believe. So uh, let me know. Give me your name, and I will put it in a hat or whatever. But I also need to know where I'm going to send it to should you win. All right, friends. MSN, San Francisco's housing market is so dire that the city's radioactive treasure island is finally getting a $6 billion makeover. Meet the residents who have lived in it for years. I wrote million in the in the uh, description of this. So when you see it, uh, no, it's it's worse than I I read it quickly. No, it's it's much worse. It's billion, billions of dollars to live in a wasteland. If I'd have known this, if I'd have read this more carefully, I, I may have given it the dunce cap of the of the of the uh, month. That uh, they're lucky I didn't see this sooner. 
Ugh, San Francisco's housing market is so dire that the city's radioactive treasure island is finally getting a $6 billion makeover. Meet the residents who have lived in it for years. Yeah. Treasure Island may be San Francisco's most unlikely neighborhood. First off, it's an island, a small man-made landmass that sits in the bay between San Fran and Oakland. There are 2,000 residents, an overpriced grocery store, geese roaming sports fields, a few wineries, abandoned buildings, and not much else. It's also a peaceful and removed from the hectic hustle and bustle, it says, of San Francisco, and uh, it's got million-dollar views. But um, the, it was a naval base, and residents who have lived there since the 1990s, some of who are low income, were formerly homeless or in need of supportive housing. Some say they've made a nice home for themselves on the beautiful isolated island. So they gave it to the poor people to die on, and now they're going to spruce it up, claim that it's safe because people are dumb enough to actually buy it and to buy the lie. And eventually, over 8,000 homes and 500 hotel rooms, upscale retailers, office space, 300 acres of parks. That'll be great for your children. Go play. Go play in Chernobyl Island. And a ferry terminal will be built on the island in the coming years. And uh, I'll tell you what they're going to do. I'll tell you how they're going to do it, too. They're going to sell you that it's safe. And what they're going to do is they're going to test for radioactive elements to which they know have already decayed or which are not showing up, not expected to show up on tests. And they'll test for those. They won't test for uranium or plutonium at any serious level. They won't test for America. They won't test for any of the countless toxic byproducts which are always spewed out in these kinds of disasters. And the reason that they won't do that is because they don't want the test results to be complete. They want to show, well, let's see, in my house, there's nothing in my house that you could hurt yourself with because I don't have a machine gun. Knives? Yeah. Firearms? Maybe. Nunchucks? A sword? But not a gun. Not a machine gun. So if you test for a machine gun, I've got nothing in my house to hurt you with. That is what they are doing with radioactive elements. And that show, that friends, is your radioactive massive Fukushima update show. Thank you for listening. Please hit share. Please hit subscribe. And if you are fortunate enough to be spending the uh, Christmas holidays, and New Year's, Christmas Eve, you know what I mean, with someone that you love, hold them very, very close. Good night, friends. God.